वसुदेव सुतम देवम कम सचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु वेलकम एवरीबॉडी टू द फॉल सेशन ऑफ द भगवत गीता क्लास आई ट्रस्ट ऑल ऑफ यू आर कीपिंग वेल एंड थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस we were able to complete the third chapter of the bhagavad gita before we closed for summer and uh, we will start the fourth chapter uh, today so just to take a very quick look back in the first chapter arjuna's sorrow we are introduced to arjuna's troubles basically that represents sorrow and suffering in human life the human condition and in the second chapter uh, krishna gives a solution an answer a very deep profound answer to the uh, question of suffering how to overcome suffering and the answer we know what krishna gave in the second chapter was knowledge of the self this uh, dramatic very profound revelation that we are not this limited person that we are not this limited body or this limited mind we are this infinite existence consciousness bliss which is uh, which is the real nature of the soul it's called the atman the self and we do not know this we have no inkling of it and therefore we think that we are this limited person this individuality which we have got right now this limited mortal being subject to birth and aging and disease and death want and suffering and that's all we know about ourselves So what Krishna said is that if we if we know our real nature if we could discover this reality which is already there and we realize that we are this atman or brahman then all our suffering would be at an end uh, we would realize that chidananda rupah shivoham shivoham i am of the nature of consciousness and bliss this would become a living reality not just something read about in theory in theory not just something that we believe in but actually experienced and that would put an end to all our sorrow now naturally arjuna's primary question was not about philosophy not even about enlightenment his question was about the problem which he was facing um the problem of this action which he had to undertake this battle he had to fight against his own relatives should he do that or should he not do that so basically the question of action it is wonderful to know that our real nature is infinite existence consciousness bliss and hopefully we will realize it but what about this present life what about this person even if i am not it i'm still stuck with it it still appears to me i'm i'm still experiencing it the people around me the problems of life and the inevitable problems of the passage of time of aging and decay and death the problems of loss and suffering which we are seeing so much now because of the pandemic we are exposed to it all the time the uh, suffering all around us the threat this invisible threat of infection and disease uh, and the news of uh, near and dear ones getting infected suffering some have had lost have lost relatives and near and dear ones and we read about well known people famous people across the world who are passing away because of this uh, illness so we are continuously exposed to the frailty of human existence uh, the how frail life is how evanescent transient life is so what do we do with this life with this body and mind there krishna sets forth the doctrine of karma yoga so the the way to realize the self is gyana yoga the path of knowledge and the way to uh, spiritualize our limited life the life which we have right here how do we spiritualize this how do we handle it uh, sri krishna gives the great teaching of karma yoga of um, Deta- detached selfless action converting our action into a worship of god spiritualizing our action so this was the teaching in the uh, second chapter in fact the second chapter is the essence of the gita um, krishna does not beat about the bush he gives go straight to the point so he has given the central teaching atma gyana self realization and uh, uh, shankaracharya says tad upaya bhutam the way to that so karma yoga spiritualizing our day to day life is a way to 
um, uh, self-realization, is a help to self-realization, is a necessary preparation to self-realization. So this is what Krishna teaches and that is the theme of the Bhagavad Gita. Again at the very end, 18th chapter, the Gita has 18 chapters. So at the very end, he will again quickly summarize the entire teachings in different words. So in between, it is the uh, teaching in detail. From chapter number 3 to chapter number 17, everything is said in detail. It reminds me of a professor of communication I had when I was a student. So he said the rule of giving a speech, uh, giving a talk, the rule is, um, tell them what you are going to tell them, then tell them, and finally tell them what you have told them. So first you have to say what you are going to say, and then say it in detail. And then in the finally you sum it up, you say this is what I said. So that's, that's the perfect uh, formula for transmitting knowledge, and that's what uh, has been done in the Bhagavad Gita. Um, an even shorter formula I heard, I read somewhere, is how to give a talk. Stand up, speak up, shut up. <laughs> Stand up, speak up, shut up. So, um, notice the whole project of the Bhagavad Gita is enlightenment, God realization, moksha, whatever you call it. So, Gita is what is called a moksha shastra, a, a, a text, a scripture which deals with the ultimate goal of human life, human emancip in emancipation, liberation, freedom from suffering. That is the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. Why I am saying this is, not that you cannot find other things in the Bhagavad Gita. There is a lot of material in this, amazing insights into human psychology. You can find leadership lessons for uh, uh, management studies. You can find, I know there, there, is, there are professors of uh, business management listening to us right now. So yes, you can actually find uh, wonderful insights into leadership, wonderful insights into how teaching can be done, education, how to teach something, wonderful insights into the human psychology, uh, insights into friendship and uh, um, into the control of the mind, into overcoming sorrow, endless insights one can gain from this. But the Gita is primarily not a text of, uh, of uh, education, business management, uh, or even physical health, although there are uh, teachings about how to be healthy, how to eat well, all of those things are there. It is primarily a te text of enlightenment, of God realization. It's called Moksha Shastra. Why I'm saying this is, I remember during my uh, fellowship at Harvard, we had a course on the Bhagavad Gita, and there was discussions, see, unless this is known, then it leads to confusion. So is the Gita a text dealing with Warfare, because the context is warfare. It's a it's a civil war between two groups of cousins, basically. So what the, what is the Gita's philosophy on warfare? It is not about warfare. If you say no, it's no use. You are saying it, but the Bhagavad Gita is definitely set in the battlefield, so it must be about warfare. No, it's not because I am saying it. For over fourteen hundred years. All the commentaries, the oldest commentary we have on the Bhagavad Gita is Shankaracharya's about 1400 years ago. But after that, so many, Ramanuja Acharya's commentary and uh, Sridhar Swami's commentary, Abhinavagupta's com, uh, commentary, Madhvacharya's commentary, so many commentaries, the classical Sanskrit commentaries, it's a big uh, corpus of work. Nowhere do they ever discuss the issue, what kind of war is it? Should this war be fought or not fought? That is not the issue. The, the, that is just the setting, the background. And very quickly, the discussion becomes about, about knowledge and the self, about God, about uh, devotion, about meditation, about transforming action into spiritual practice, about yoga basically. So that is what the central message of the Bhagavad Gita is. The central message of the Bhagavad Gita is nothing other than the central message of the Upanishads. So, the, the teaching of, of spiritual knowledge, that is the central message. Again, not denying the fact that you can derive a lot of benefit, a lot of insights for different spheres of human activity from the Bhagavad Gita. But the central purpose, so I, I insisted again and again in the class, remember the central purpose is moksha. Otherwise, you will end up with these tangles, uh, in this confusion. Uh, what is, why is Krishna not talking about the war? Arjuna's question was about the war. 
once Krishna starts teaching, he's teaching Vedanta. The, the war is left far behind. If it was about the war, it was really about the situation in the Mahabharata, about the Kauravas and the Pandavas and the issues between them and, and the war, what interest would it have to us today? Why would Mahatma Gandhi be interested in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, would draw his inspiration from the Bhagavad Gita? Um, so, why would generations of Indians and non-Indians um, in recent times, why would they derive inspiration from the Bhagavad Gita if it's about a war fought between in ancient times between uh, two groups of cousins, in, uh, like a civil war in some, uh, some royal dynasty? thousands of years ago. What interest would it have except as a historical curiosity? No, it is not about war. It is about uh, human life and the possibility of a deep solution to the, suffer the question of suffering in human life. Uh, 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 a wonderful spiritual philosophy, how to live a much better life and how to attain the goal of human life. What is the goal of human life? How to attain it and how to live, live a very a deeply fulfilling and satisfactory life in this world where your life is a blessing to you and to everyone else around you. So that's the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, in the third chapter, Arjuna asked for, for further details about Karma Yoga. So remember, when we are studying from the Advaita Vedanta perspective, the paradigm is clear. We do not know we are Brahman or Atman. And we need to know that. We need to realize it. So ignorance is the problem and knowledge is the solution. But knowledge will not come unless um, the mind is prepared, unless the character is ready. So to prepare the ground, all the other sadhana, spiritual practices, meditation, selfless service, devotion to God, karma yoga, um, uh, raja yoga, Bhakti Yoga, all of these in the Advaita Vedanta paradigm, they are all useful. They do not directly lead to moksha, into, uh, to enlightenment and liberation, but they are very useful. They prepare the ground and then when the, when the seeker is prepared, the teaching of Vedanta, the teaching of self-knowledge, it works. You get liberation. So that is the paradigm. Now why I am saying that is, that is from the Advaita Vedanta perspective. So Advaita Vedanta will say, yes, it's a Moksha Shastra. Every system of Indian philosophy will say, yes, the Bhagavad Gita is a Moksha Shastra. Uh, I mean, uh, of, uh, of Orthodox Indian philosophy will say Bhagavad Gita is a Moksha Shastra. But what is the central message? Is it knowledge or is it devotion? Is it action? That will depend upon the, the, the school of philosophy uh, you adhere to. In the Advaita Vedanta school of philosophy, the central teaching is knowledge. But if you go to one of the Vaishnava Vedanta schools, they will say the central teaching is, is Bhakti. Uh, so, it depends on, on the paradigm, the intellectual paradigm through which you are examining the Bhagavad Gita. Now, chapter 4. So, chapter 2 is the whole Bhagavad Gita in a nutshell. Chapter 3 is a, a detailed uh, analysis of Karma Yoga and its relation to Jnana Yoga. Chapter 4 is actually about Jnana Yoga. Chapter 4 is also about Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge. But there are other details. Uh, there are interesting things. For example, this is the first time that Krishna will speak about himself as an avatar, as an incarnation of God. So that's a very interesting detail. So let us start the fourth chapter. I'll chant the first verse. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Imam Vivasvate Yogam Proktavanaham Abhyayam Vivaswan Manave Praha Manu Rikshvakave Bravit What does it mean? The Blessed Lord said, Krishna said, This immutable yoga, this unchanging spiritual teaching I taught it to the sun god, Vivaswan, who taught it to Manu and Manu proclaimed it to Ikshvaku. So what's going on here? This is basically what is called um, Jnana Stuti or Gita Stuti, a praise of the knowledge, the knowledge which has already been imparted in second chapter and third chapter. Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, the way to attain 
self-knowledge and the preparatory practices of karma yoga. These have already been taught. Second chapter, third chapter. Now Krishna is saying, this spiritual knowledge which I have taught you just now, I taught it to the sun god Ikshvaku. In the days of yore, I taught it to sun god Ikshvaku, who taught it to his son. There's now there are two sons here, S-U-N and S-O-N. So <laughs> sun god is S-U-N. Uh, the name used is Vivaswan. Vivaswan is the name of, of the sun. Why? It means that which nourishes food. Annam. Annam means food. So food is nourished by the sun. What it means is the sun obviously causes evaporation and rainfall which helps in the growth of crops. Also the sunlight as we know it helps in photosynthesis and the growth of plants. Basically food is nourished by the sun. So sun is called Vivaswan. Um, the sun god, at the beginning of creation, I gave this knowledge to the sun god. And, uh, and then the sun god passed on this knowledge to, uh, to his son. Now it is S-O-N, son, who is Manu. And Manu passed on this knowledge to the ancient king Ikshvaku. So he is giving the lineage of this knowledge. One of the ways in which knowledge is praised is in ancient scriptures. You will find it in, in, in the Old Testament also. Um, I remember I went to this synagogue which is very close to the Vedanta Society, just two blocks away. It's the oldest synagogue in the United States, more than 300 years ago, the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue. So I attended one of the Shabbats there. And uh, they were reading from the, uh, the Torah. And a lot of it was, this is the son of this. He was the son of this or, um, and the son of um, th this person was that person and so on. So it's a lineage. Uh, similarly, here he's giving a lineage of this knowledge. Already he's indicating who he is. It can't be this Krishna. This Krishna was, um, was, is a contemporary of Arjuna, born a few years just before Arjuna. How could he give this knowledge to, um, to the sun god, who, the, you know, who is created at the beginning of the universe probably? So, um, so here he's indicating two things. I have given this knowledge in ancient times. One of the, the primary role of the avatar is to uh, teach spirituality. The primary role of the avatar is to teach spirituality. It will come later in details. But when we say chant the mantra to Sri Ramakrishna, sthapakaya cha dharmasya, the one who establishes religion. So to re-establish our faith in religion, that spirituality is real, that it's a real solution, real answer to our questions, and that it is of enormous benefit to us, that it takes us to the real goal of human life. This is taught by the incarnation. So that is the prime role of the incarnation. And this he says, I did this, I taught this knowledge at the beginning of creation to the sun god, Vivaswan. And Vivaswan taught it to, um, to his son, Manu. Manu is regarded as the, the origin or the founder of the human race. In Sanskrit, uh, human beings are called Manavaha. So Manava comes from Manu. And each cycle, each time the universe is created, and it exists for some time. You know, we have a cyclical theory of creation, existence and destruction. So the universe has been created and existed and it was destroyed many times in the past. So in this present cycle, every, every cycle there is a uh, Manu who creates the human race. So this is the way it is understood. So in this cycle, the Manu is called, the particular Manu who was there at the source of all our uh, human beings is called Vaivaswata Manu. So you will see in Sanskrit, hymns and in rituals, the word will come again and again. Vaivasvata Manvantare, in the age of the Vaivasvata Manu. Who, who is this? This is our age, the, the universe we live in. So that Vaivasvata Manu who was at the beginning of the human race, you can take it in a symbolic form, that God has given this spiritual knowledge. That's all it means. In uh, the Upanishad, it, it comes, Mundaka Upanishad, it says, I gave this knowledge uh, of the Vedas, to Brahma at the, at the beginning of creation and Brahma taught it to the Rishis. So in the Vedas and the Upanishads, it is God who reveals this knowledge uh, to the first sentient beings 
long before there are human beings. So this spiritual knowledge comes and that's another indication that the Bhagavad Gita is nothing other than the essential spiritual knowledge which is given in the Vedas. The Vedas are this mass of spiritual knowledge. Some of it is Karma Kanda which is to help human beings to achieve their worldly goals. Kama, Artha, Dharma. Dharma here is the ritualistic religion of the Vedas. Kama and Artha means our worldly goals of prosperity, of um, pleasure. We can, we can take the help of the ritualistic portion of the Vedas to achieve um, satisfaction and happiness in this world and the next world. But the essence of the Vedic teaching, the highest Vedic teaching is spiritual. And that is found in the Upanishads, which are also parts of the Vedas. The, the highest, the final, the ultimate teaching of, of the Vedas is in the Upanishads. That's why it is called Vedanta. Anta here means not just end, it really means Siddhanta, the final conclusion, the conclusive highest ultimate teachings of the Vedas. And those essential teachings of the uh, Vedas found in the Upanishads has been taught now by me, Krishna, to you, Arjuna. Where? Second chapter and third chapter. So, what I taught you is the essence of the Upanishads. And what is the essence of the Upanishads? It's the final teaching, ultimate teaching of the Vedas. And all of this, the Vedas and the Upanishads, those teachings I have been giving to all sentient beings from the beginning of creation. That's the meaning of this verse. And what did Manu do? He gave it to the ancient kings, starting with Ikshvaku. Now, notice one thing. They are all householders, just like Krishna and uh, Arjuna. So, one important point that spirituality, is it just for rishis, for monks and sages? No. All of them who are being mentioned here. So, in some sense, the sun god is also a householder. And uh, there probably is a Mrs. sun god also. And then, Manu is definitely a householder. Ikshvaku is a householder. They are all grihasthas. Uh, Krishna is a grihastha. Arjuna is a grihastha. So, they are all a lineage of householders. That means, this highest spirituality they can attain perfection through this. People have, from ancient times, through this, these practices, people have been attaining liberation, overcoming suffering, attaining moksha. Um, what else? Abhyayam Yoga, he says, Abhyayam, the unchanging, eternal spiritual teaching. Yoga here means the spiritual teaching. Just take it as Jnana Yoga and Karma Yoga together. There are different interpretations. There is one commentator who says that, see, third chapter was talking about karma yoga. So that, sh that is being con continued here. So fourth chapter, when he says, I taught this eternal yoga, Krishna means I taught karma yoga too. But you can take it as the whole spiritual teaching. Shankaracharya takes it as the entire spiritual teaching. This whole uh, Upanishadic teaching in the Gita, which I have given you, is eternal, is unchanging. It is the essence of religion. This is what is meant by Sanatana Dharma. Eternally, this, this knowledge, spiritual knowledge has been existing. From age to age, it is given to human beings. It is the essence of all religions. You see, I say that Vedanta is at the core of all religions. One might say, isn't it being fanatical to say that? I said, no. By Vedanta, I don't mean that you have to use the word Vedanta or Upanishads or Gita. Basically, this highest spirituality, this is to be found in all religions. Aldous Huxley, he used the term perennial philosophy. Perennial philosophy, very beautiful book. He shows the highest spiritual thoughts uh, are found very directly, very powerfully in the Vedanta in India. But in its essence, it is there in every religion. Without it, a religion will not be a religion. I will be as so bold as to say, without this Vedantic ideas, the central spiritual ideas, religion is just a mass of myths and superstitions. So every religion has this core. And that's why he says, Abhyayam, this unchanging spiritual truth, from age to age you find it. Um, just as an aside, Aldous Huxley in the first chapter he talks about that Tattva Masi, the highest truth of the Upanishads, uh, that I am Brahman, that's the ul ultimate reality, that you and the ultimate reality of the universe are one reality. And then he makes an interesting uh, observation. He says the usual academic way of dealing with it is, that in the Vedas you find a gradual evolution of ideas from uh, polytheistic to 
uh, one uh, ultimate God of the universe and then from ritualism to knowledge to, to meditation to knowledge to ultimately the identity, Aham Brahmasmi. So like an evolution. But Aldous Huxley says, my instinct is that this ultimate spiritual truth was always there with humanity. Even in prehistoric times, he says, it's quite possible um, there were spiritual people who realized this. Now recently, I was uh, discussing this with um, Swami Tadanandaji, who is now in Brisbane. He's our new head of our, our new center in New Zealand. But right now, due to the, the pandemic lockdown, he is in Brisbane, in Australia. He was doing some research with the Australian Aborigines, which is, who are a very ancient people. So they have something called the dream time, uh, a spiritual state they talk about. And he was saying this, this ancient idea of, this, this uh, fundamental idea of uh, divine unity, that there's one reality underlying all of nature and one must identify with it. They have it. They have had it for, I mean, the Aborigines have been there for at least 40,000 years. So long before our civilizations, the world civilizations came about, they were there and they had some kind of, you know, pre-Advaitic knowledge uh, of this divine unity. So it's there everywhere. Abhyayam. Um, now, at this point, what I'll do is, in this uh, Ram Sukhdas Ji's book, Gita, the Sadhak Sanjeevani, he has made many wonderful observations. So I will quickly share those with you uh, about this first verse or fourth chapter. So he also mentions, notice that they are all grihasthas, uh, whoever has been mentioned here uh, in this first verse. So spiritual realization is possible not only in monastic life, but also in householder life. This is one central point. Then the second point he makes, the relationship between Jiva and Brahman, between the, between the human and God is eternal relationship. Now, I would like to interject something here. Ram Sukhdas Ji was a Vishishtadvaitin. He was a not non-dualist. So the qualified non-dualism of Ramanujacharya says, not that you and Brahman are one. Now, Aham Brahma has been not in that sense. Uh, in Vishishtadvaita, there is one divine reality, Brahman, which they identify with Narayana. And all of us, all sentient beings, all living jivas, we are all parts. We are one with Narayana, but we are parts of Narayana, not identical. So we have a relationship with God. Relationship is of part and whole. In Sanskrit, amsha amshi. Another term used is sesha sheshi. All sentient beings are called shesha or amsha. Parts, aspects of the divine whole. And the divine whole, God, Brahman, Narayana is called Amshi or Sheshi. We all have all heard of Shesha Naga uh, on which Vishnu reclines. So that's where the term comes from, Shesha. Now, what Ramsukdasti says, so our relation with God is eternal. You don't have to do anything to establish that relationship. It's already there. And the path to God realization, the path to the realization of this relationship. Uh, what, is the path, what is the path? The path of knowledge, the path of uh, meditation, the path of devotion, the path of uh, devoted service, karma, bhakti, jnana, dhyana, all these paths. These paths are also eternal. Your relation to God is eternal and your path to God is also eternal. That's an important point he wants to make. Our relation with God is already there. You don't have to establish a relationship. So notice the difference between Advaita. Advaita would say, you and God are one reality, identical. He is saying, you are not identical, but you have a relation with God. But both are similar in one sense. That your identity with Brahman, that you are Brahman is already there. We just don't know it. And Ramsukdashti or, or Vishishtadvaita Vedanta of Ramanuja is saying, your relation with God is already there. We don't know it. Um, so what do you have to do? Why don't we know it? Because we are engrossed with the non-eternal. Our eternal relationship with God is forgotten, not recognized, because we are engrossed with non-eternal. What is non-eternal? Anitya. Work, the activities with the people, with the objects of the world, with the events of the world, good and bad. 
with the temptations and the terrors of the world, all non-eternal. If it's non-eternal, then it's not divine. But we are engrossed in that and we have forgotten our eternal relationship with God. Then the way out is, he says, is shown by Karma Yoga. All the non-eternal parts which we, we see right now, body, my actions, my possessions, surrender all of them to God. Say, I and my Lord, that's all. Everything else is for samsara, for the service of God, not for me. So if you surrender our non-eternal relations with the world and hold on to the eternal relation with God, this is the way. This is the essence of Karma Yoga. He has given seven nice insights into Karma Yoga. From his entire commentary, I just drew it out. Seven nice insights, which I will quickly share. Sun God, the example of Sun God, Vivaswan. So uh, he says that, he, I mean Ram Sukhdasji, he says, look at the sun which shines and gives light and heat to the world selflessly and continuously. Always active, blazing forth, always active. And the light which the sun shines on the world is completely detached from what it shines on. It shines on the good and on the bad. It shines on good events and bad events. It shines on pro problems and shine, shines on solutions. And it is not affected by anything in the world. So he says, this is a great model for Karma Yogi. Continuously active and totally detached. So the sun is a very great model for Karma Yogi. So that's a nice in insight. And sun is always there. You see the sun, now you can remember. What is the sun doing? Karma Yoga. Sun is doing Karma Yoga. I should also be like the sun. I should continuously act, give and be detached. Not be affected uh, by anything which is non-eternal. The second insight he gives is, see we always act to get, we, we do all our actions to get things from the world. And notice, in all our experiences in the world, whatever we do, food and music and engagement and our electronic devices, our um, uh, friends and relatives, education, uh, all of it, all kinds of pleasure and achievement in the world, karma and artha, all kinds including name and fame, glory, all of that, it declines in its value. We chase it, we get it, when we start enjoying it very quickly, the happiness we get from it, the satisfaction we get from it, it declines. So I was reminded of the first teaching in economics, the law of diminishing marginal utility. The whole point of economic activity is that we have desires and those desires must be satisfied. For that we uh, do economic activity, work and produce things, consume things. As we consume things, the things which we want, they give us satisfaction. But the satisfaction, the, uh, the thing to notice is, the satisfaction from the first unit of consumption, eat a cookie, lot of satisfaction. Eat a second cookie, less satisfaction. Eat a third cookie, no satisfaction. Eat a fourth cookie, you'll be like, you'll feel sick. So, marginal utility, the utility from the each additional unit of consumption declines. So, this was one of the first things that is taught to us in uh, economics. And this, uh, Ram Sukhdasji says, this is the nature of all worldly bhoga. It is, uh, he sounds like a pessimist, uh, raining on our parade. All your activities, oh humans, he says, they are doomed to end in dissatisfaction. The, you are doing it everything for satisfaction, the satisfaction will disappear just like that, very soon, bound to. All the anitya, impermanent entities in the world, if you chase them, it could be a person, it could be money, it could be activity, it could be some status, it will disappear very soon. And it, the satisfaction from it will disappear. On the other hand, the satisfaction from the Lord from bhakti, from meditation, from karma yoga and from knowledge, from all the yogas, the satisfaction keeps on increasing. And even when one attains God realization, it's not that the satisfaction is now then steady or declines. No, prema, he says, the bhakti becomes prema, uh, love of the Lord, intense love of God. And that every day, every hour it is increasing. Narada Bhakti Sutra also says, pratikshanam, moment to moment it keeps on increasing. Just the opposite of all worldly pursuits. Then, this is the um, second insight. Third insight, how should one do karma yoga? 
he says uh, in hindi apne liye mat karo apne liye mat chaho aur apna na mano three things don't work for yourself don't want anything for yourself and don't possess even the things are there but mentally don't say these are mine all of this is the lord's i will do everything for the lord i do not want anything for myself everything i do is for the worship of the lord yes i may want good things for other people let others be happy like swami vivekananda said give give and never look back he who looks back his ocean dwindles into a drop so the idea of karma yoga is just the opposite of the usual idea of karma karma is we do things for ourselves and we want things and then we get those things we identify these are mine these are mine he says reverse all of that all the same activity can be done mental change in in the perspective i am not doing it for myself one but then don't you want anything no i don't want anything he says it's foolishness to want whatever you want will disappear into from within minutes in from within a short while all satisfaction from those things will disappear and the things themselves will also disappear soon and then the third thing is uh, never say that these are mine even though you have don't worry i mean it's not that all your possessions will disappear everything will be there but mentally say all this belongs to the lord these people around me my relatives they are the lord's people people colleagues at my work people in my community the lord has uh, has come in the, in those forms so not mine and not for myself and not work for myself so three things don't work for yourself don't want anything for yourself don't even have the sense of possession even when things and people are around you um uh, fourth fourth point is kamana mamata asakti same thing in uh, other way he is saying these create impurity desire creates impurity more you give up desire less desire there is the more purity you will feel within yourself a kind of freedom and a natural holiness will come to you the less identification you have mamata means identification this is mine that is not mine these are my people those are not my people all are my people and i am detached from all so that is uh, the more you are detached the more you are attached more impurity the more you are detached more sense of purity will come and asakti asakti is uh, attachment actually the mamata is identification it is mine and not mine asakti is attachment to a work to a place to a food to a person our attachment should be to god and through god to everybody else my lord is present in all of them fine but my attachment is the lord to the lord and lord alone this is purifying the opposite is it creates impurity in the mind then the next point he makes is fifth point should there be no desire for result he says no there should be no desire for the result of my actions karma yoga no desire for the result of my action but that does not mean that i will not have a, gain, a, a goal uh, there must be a goal there is a goal in life the goal in life is to experience god is to realize god is to overcome suffering is to attain moksha spiritual goal is there so karma yoga has the highest goal but no uh, selfish desire for results so desire for result is not the same thing as not having a goal there is a goal of life and all my karma yoga is for the goal of life but um the desire for uh, results is given up a lot of people ask how can you do anything if you don't have a desire you can do something you have if you have a very high goal or purpose in life you just don't have a it's not a personal selfish desire the goal in life is god realization that does not mean that there is going to be in particular selfish desires then the sixth point he may, says is very beautiful he says once you start acting in this unselfish way karma is converted into karma yoga the power of god will act through you the power of god will manifest through you how you see the lord is continuously engaged in the welfare of all beings if you if we start 
engaging ourselves, our time, energy, money and the welfare of all beings, then our purpose and God's purpose, we may be tiny and God is cosmic, but our purpose is now in harmony with God's purpose. You desire the welfare of everybody, God also desires the welfare of everybody. So the power of God starts working through you and we see it. It's not a rhetorical point he's making. I see it all the time. Ordinary person is transformed into something extraordinary just because that person does not want anything for himself or herself and wants good for others. May not even believe in God. But once the person wants something just good for others and has no personal axe to grind, then a unique power descends on that person. Tremendous. I know this person, there are so many such examples I know, who transformed their lives. Ordinary people became extraordinary just because they gave up their ordinary desires and they only had the desire of the goodness for others. And their lives become, becomes extraordinary. And then finally, one a practical suggestion, neither seek nor avoid. This is Swami Vivekananda is saying, neither seek nor avoid. So now I'm going to practice Karma Yoga. So now Shana, what are you doing? I'm browsing to see a suitable um, uh, you know, program, action, uh, social service program, which will, which is worthy of my great Karma Yoga from now on. No, don't have to do that. Uh, he says in Hindi, Ram Sukhdas Ji, Har paristhiti ka sad upayog karna hi karma yog hai. Whatever situation one is in, with whomever you are in, with whatever resources you have, maybe you have no resources at all, just you're a person who, who is completely helpless, maybe a person just lying down in the bed and sick, that person also, every situation can be spiritualized. Whatever situation one is in, with whomever we are with and whatever little resource we have, if I change my attitude to it, that I am going to worship the Lord with all of this and I don't want anything. I don't identify with anything. I don't possess anything. If I do that, it becomes Karma Yoga. So these are the seven nice insights into Karma Yoga Ram Sukhdas Ji has given. Let me quickly take questions. I don't know, are there people who have raised hands? Jayant? Uh, no, Nobody? Okay. So let me just go ahead then. Verse number 2. Verse number 2. Evam param para praptam imam rajarshayo vidu sakale neha mahata Yogo Nashta Parantapa. The royal sages have known this yoga. Rajarshi means a royal sage, a king, a philosopher king basically. Royal sages have known this yoga, thus traditionally transmitted, O valiant prince, due to lapse of long time, passage of time. This yoga has perished in this world. So what is he saying here? First of all, the concept of a Rajarshi. Raja is a king. So again, Kshatriyas, the warriors, who are all householders. It's not enough to be a householder or a Kshatriya. One must be a philosophical or a spiritual householder, a spiritual king. Swami Vivekananda has spoken about this. How you find in the history of Vedanta, this knowledge has been handed down from kings and princes. Even in the Upanishads, you find Janaka is, a, uh, is, a, is an emperor. Um, there were others also, Ajata, Shatru and all in Brihadarnik Upanishad you find, they are emperors and kings. Swami Vivekananda said, these ancient monarchs, they were people of enormous power and responsibility. If they could find time and the motivation to practice these things, how much more so we should be able to do that? We keep complaining, we have no time, we are busy. Are you more busy than an, uh, than an emperor? Not today's emperors who are figureheads. But in those ancient days, so they are Rajarshi. They found it useful that this is something useful for their practical life, for their, um, their action, their ruling the kingdom and for their own spiritual life also. And so they practiced it. Rajarshi. Parampara praptam. So it has been transmitted from teacher to student. Sometimes they were uh, uh, teachers and students, sometimes from parents to children. Sometimes we find fathers teaching the sons. Sometimes we find mother teaching the children. So it has been transmitted down in an unbroken lineage. Uh, and at the source of which? 
is Krishna. He says, I taught it at the beginning. But what happened? Kale Naya Mahata. Over time, this transmission of knowledge it decays. It degenerates. The essential message is lost. And uh, religion becomes overcome like a, like a garden with weeds. And the flowering plant, the whole point of the garden is now lost because now there are all kinds of weeds and brambles and uh, uh, thorns. What happens is, it's, it's, nothing, it's not the problem of the religion, not the problem of the original teaching. It's just human uh, frailty. Uh, rituals overcome, the, the spirit is lost, ritualism predominates. Or politics comes into play, uh, violence comes into play, or greed uh, enters into religion. Organized religion, then the necessity of the organization becomes more important than the spirituality. Um, unethical practices creep into religious organizations. All of this leads to degeneration. So, the commentators say, the teachers and the practitioners of the spiritual knowledge, they become distracted by the many temptations of the world and they lose the spirit of the original teachings. So, many temptations. Uh, Krishna is saying to Arjuna in Mahabharata, today if he saw our temptations and our attractions all around, the distraction caused by digital age, uh, so many devices and uh, he would be uh, stunned. I don't know what he would say. Um, Daniel Goleman, who, uh, who coined the term emotional intelligence, so he has written a book, Focus on Concentration, because he has heard, he, was, he is saying that he has heard so much from teachers and parents and corporate executives, how young people today, little kids and even teenagers or even young men and women are so distracted that they can't concentrate. From moment to moment, their attention keeps flickering. And one main reason is this digital technology which we have, social media and everything else. In fact, right now, there is a documentary called Social Dilemma. So many people are seeing it now. I also saw it recently. Um, and it's about the danger of, of uh, social media. And after seeing that, I'm hearing in university campuses among young people, many people are, are switching off their Facebook and their Twitter and all of that. They're coming out of it because it's so scary when you see that, how distracting it can be. It is distracting for all worldly pursuits. You cannot study properly, you cannot do your job properly, you cannot maintain your relationships in the household properly. And what, it, what damage it will do to religion, spirituality, that is uh, beyond imagination. So, social media, distraction. In those days also, Krishna is saying, Kale na yamahata yoga nashtaha. This nashta means lost, degenerated, becomes ineffective, uninspiring. We see before the coming of Sri Ramakrishna, people are losing faith in religion. Whether religion is just a mass of superstition, uh, it's just for uneducated people, the educa people educated in English education, whether we are sophisticated, we are like the British rulers, and all this local religion, Hinduism, it's all for uh, less educated people, less fortunate people. We don't believe in all these things. So it required somebody like Sri Ramakrishna to come and demonstrate at the doorstep of Calcutta, the doorstep of the, uh, the capital of the British Empire. So you see, it was the very strategic meeting place between uh, the Western world and India, the capital of the British Empire in Calcutta in those days. And the doorstep of that, Sri Ramakrishna demonstrated in his life, day in and day out, God exists, God can be experienced. And if God is experienced, God is realized, the purpose of human life is fulfilled. The goal of human life is fulfilled. That is the whole purpose of this whole drama of, of human existence. So he demonstrated this and the faith of people was re-established. And he says, I chose you, Krishna says to Arjuna. Why Arjuna? Uh, he says, because, he will say later on, you are my friend, that's why I have chosen you. Uh, Arjuna asks the question, please teach me. And that's why Krishna teaches. So one must be a willing student to be to be fit for it. Arjuna represents all of humanity. So by teaching Arjuna, Krishna is transmitting the knowledge, revivifying that knowledge which was has become weakened over time. This same knowledge, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Raja Yoga, all of this. 
Sri Krishna is teaching with new force again in the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna so that it will be transmitted to the to humankind again. Exactly like what Sri Ramakrishna did through Swami Vivekananda. Among all the disciples, he picked one specifically who would spread it across the world in this age again. One more point. This also prevents uh, fanaticism. The very idea that uh, religious practices can decline through no fault, fault of the religion itself. And it requires new teaching, a new way of understanding religion again, new way of presenting religion in a fresh way. This prevents fanaticism. Otherwise, what happens is any new attempt will be condemned. This is not what it is. The original teaching and the original teacher, that much only is right. What we find in our old books, in our old teachers, that's it. Nothing new can happen in religion. Why not? This idea is very uh, common in Hinduism. That great teachers will come. You may accept an avatar, you may not accept an avatar. But great teachers will keep coming from age to age and will present religion in a fresh new form. As he said, the essential teaching is eternal. It's there, he says, from the beginning of the creation, I have been giving this teaching. But it is given newly each time. And a new demonstration of the truths of religion is done each time. Then number three. Saivayam maya tedya yoga prokta puratana bhakto si me sakha cheti Rahasyam Uttamam. That same ancient yoga has now been proclaimed to you by me. For you are a devotee and my comrade. Knowledge of this yoga indeed is the highest mystery. So it is self-explanatory. That yoga which has been which has declined over the centuries, over the millennia, I have I have given this teaching again to you. And he says, Why? You are my friend, not only my friend, there are many others who are my friends. Bhaktosi, you are devoted, devoted to me. You have surrendered because Arjuna before the second chapter, he said, I don't understand. I give up. You teach me. So that has to be said. I would like to learn and I would like to change and change my life by accepting your, your teachings. So once we take the position of a student, the Lord is most willing to teach us. Bhaktosi me sakhachet. One great Swami who taught the Bhagavad Gita many years ago, not before, well before my time, but I got his notes. In the first class of the Bhagavad Gita, he would always say, remember who is teaching you. This is not a pundit, a scholar. It's not your professor. It's not a philosopher. The Lord himself, incarnation of God, is teaching you. Accept the teachings with that kind of an attitude, that kind of a tremendous reverence and alertness. This teaching will transform my life. It's the most precious thing in the universe for me. So that is the attitude one takes to this teaching. Rahasyam idam uttamam. This is the highest secret. One of the names for Upanishads is also Rahasya Vidya, secret. Secret in what sense? In the sense that it is valuable, it is most valuable. Uttamam, supreme secret. Why most valuable? Because it removes all suffering and gives us permanent satisfaction. Atyantika dukkha nivritti, paramananda prapti. It fulfills our purpose of life. Whatever we are doing, we are doing it unwisely. We are seeking satisfaction, but we are doing it unwisely. You seek it, seek satisfaction from the world outside, never going to get it. Seek satisfaction from spirituality, from God realization, guaranteed that you will get it. So, Uttamam, this is the supreme uh, secret. And why secret? Because it is hidden from us. It is right here. So in front of our noses, not even front, behind our noses. It is you yourself. But unfortunately, our attention is turned outwards. So we don't see it. It has to be taught. It has to be shown, pointed out. Um, and I have taught you now. Arjuna, you can imagine... He has a quizzical expression on his face. He's like, hold on. I've heard all you said, but you are now saying that you taught, you Krishna, you taught it at the beginning of creation to the sun god. But you were born just yesterday. You're just a little couple of few years older than me. I know you are the son of Vasudeva, of Devaki. You are my contemporary. And the sun god was created at the beginning of creation of the universe. 
how could you teach the sun god so that is the question so it is the occasion for krishna to declare himself as an avatar as an incarnation of god not just your friend uh-huh. and not just a son of vasudeva and devaki i am the lord of the universe i am just reminded uh, of sri ramakrishna talking to m suddenly in one place he says suddenly turns upon m and says tell me i know all your past and your future and suddenly m is overcome by something he does not he feels something you know and he folds his hand he says yes lord you know so few people recognize girish ghosh recognized uh, narendra not recognized but he argued against it and doubted it till the very very end it was very difficult to say this simple man most people think is a madman is he god this simple man who is the charioteer arjuna is the warrior and his charioteer driver shafar is krishna this is god very difficult to accept so arjuna asks this question number 4 i'll do this and we'll stop and see take questions there might be one or two questions here arjuna vacha aparam bhavato janma param janma vivasvata kathaṁ me tad vijāniyāṁ tvamādau proktavāniti Arjuna said, Your birth was later, that of son Vivaswan, much earlier. How then am I to take it that you imparted this yoga in the beginning, you know, the beginning of the universe? How is that possible? <laughs> so this is the question and uh, Krishna will use it to introduce the, the concept of avatara, incarnation of God, that we will see next time. I think Jayant, somebody has asked a question. Yeah, uh, Unam ji. Yes, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, uh, Swami ji, uh, the Guru Shishya Parampara has been pointed out by Bhagwan. Yes. So that means the spiritual lesson should always be learned by a realized master, and self-study might lead to misinterpretation. Um. realized master there are two two components to the question you just asked one is can self study be lead to misinterpretation should it be learned from a teacher second part is does the teacher have to be a realized and enlightened being the answer to the first one is yes it might lead to misunderstanding so it's good to learn it from a teacher um, just as we are doing it now we are studying it together so that's all right you can learn it from a teacher but does it have to be an enlightened being an enlightened teacher uh, the upanishads are very clear about this who is an enlightened teacher uh, we don't know how do we know you might feel a person is very spiritual and that's the most you can feel i feel this person is advanced this person is spiritual unless you are enlightened yourself uh, how will you know who else is enlightened so what the upanishads say is three criterion for a teacher three criteria one is um, brahmanishta um akamahata and then uh, abrahmanishta akamahata and shrotriya brahmanishta shrotriya akamahata three three qualifications one is the teacher must be a full time teacher a full time spiritual uh, aspirant not a part timer you know that i am this business tycoon and also in my spare time i'm a guru that might work with you know um, pilates or uh, you know hatha yoga you can do that you can do it in your spare time teach some exercise some to some people no problem but spiritual life if you're going to be a spiritual teacher you must be fully committed to it your life must be entirely dedicated to spirituality brahmanishta means one who is dedicated established in brahman literally it would mean an enlightened person who is free you know jeevan mukta but those are rare it's good enough if a person is completely dedicated in spiritual life and has nothing else the whole one pointed thing is that i am a seeker of of spirituality i am this is my entire life and has been so uh, for many many years so what we do in our our order is the president of the order the vice president of the order the ones who give spiritual initiation and who are the gurus for many many decades they have been monks of the order who are completely dedicated to spirituality and we others monks and devotees have observed their lives 
and this is uh, we say this is a worthy person i will take initiation from this person so that's brahmanishta second that's also not enough the other thing we required is um shrotriya shrotriya means shruti means the upanishads vedas a person who's well versed in spiritual knowledge so when you are a teacher uh, it could it's quite possible that it sometimes a person may be deeply spiritual but not learned in in the in the formal sense of the term so there must be some spiritual lore which you can transmit not everybody is equally cut out to be uh, a, a teacher so swami vivekananda and swami adbhutananda latu maharaj both were enlightened but it is vivekananda who is a world teacher so that other this mass of spiritual knowledge which a teacher has to master to be able to transmit effectively so you have to know see notice this is a, a knowledge which is being handed down god handed it to the sun god and then through that to manu, manu and to ikshvak went down like a long series of uh, teacher and student what was being handed down was realization being handed down was enlightenment being handed out not possible it's that that knowledge system which was being handed down sometimes well sometimes not so well but it was being handed down what is it that decayed did enlightenment decay that's not possible it's that knowledge system that handing down process became corrupt and then it has to be freshened refreshed again so shrotriya one must be a master uh, i mean in our system you have to be a master of advaita vedanta you must know the upanishads you must know the brahma sutras and the bhagavad gita you must have learned it systematically so that you can teach it so that is called shrotriya second and the third qualification is um is akamahata literally it means not destroyed or damaged by desire very nicely termed not damaged by kama by desire so the search for personal gratification is dangerous if it, if it if a teacher does it um, is a position of power and respect so you often hear of cult leaders who demand absolute obedience and they um and it leads to you know there are so many stories of awful forms of exploitation um so the guru the teacher must be free of any desire for personal gratification may have a desire for the welfare of others for the welfare of the students but not for himself or herself akama hata not damaged by desire it should not be here is uh, vedanta i am teaching you uh, and then now you must obey me and i am like in charge of your lives like a some kind of a little hitler or something like that no that should not happen so these three qualifications shrotriya brahmanishta akama hata then it, a person can be a guru you can learn from that person yes and is there a special reason why the supreme vedanta has been handed down to the rulers of the world like kshatriyas not the brahmins both brahmins and kshatriyas so there is a, a whole lineage through which rishis and uh, you know the sages and monks and the brahmins they have got it also but the kshatriyas have also got it um, that that's one another line of transmission that we find from ancient times onwards and it shows that it it's actually a very practical system of knowledge every one of us we can use it it's not abstract philosophy only uh, it's it's literally the highest spiritual knowledge i mean on in all my little exploration of different traditions different philosophies i have never found as, something as profound as deep as relevant as rational and as powerful as direct as this vedantic teaching advaitic teaching so both you, kshatriyas and um uh, and the brahmins also yeah all right uh before we end i'll make a little appeal to you since our ashram has been closed physically we haven't had visitors because of the pandemic and so financially we also suffer we don't uh, get the uh, donations we used to get earlier so i'll just uh, request all of you to make a small donation uh, whatever uh, seems suitable to you you can just go to our website the vedanta society of new york website you'll find a small uh, 
thing donate at the top you click there you can donate through paypal that is uh, easiest or you can send a check uh, it's it's it'll be very good if uh, we if you can donate like we give small donations uh, after the class it's uh, what bill used to do you know those of you used to come, you have come here at the end of the class bill who's now 96 now he would get up and totter across the uh, room with a little basket so bill's basket is now virtual <laughs> so whatever seems reasonable to you just uh, make it a habit of giving like these small donations regularly all right let me end with a uh, shanti prayer om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu take care let me see all of you <laughs> take care stay well stay well thank you swami ji thank, thank you. you thank you, thank you. take care Namaste, 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 Namaste,